So, that, so just to let you know, I'm going to move this other way as well. I'm very, very funny in retrospect, um, <laughs> as one beautiful reviewer told me. Um, I'm trying to be, so normally what I do, I'm also going to be using a microphone. I don't really like using them, but I, I'm going to be doing that. So if I, I'm not very good at it. Oh, treat women better. Oh, um, so if I, if I get distracted and I start, can you just be like, in, don't do that noise. Uh, be doing a minute. Yeah, do that friendly gesture, like you're cuddling a jellyfish. Um, so I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be more relatable. But so basically, what I do is I'm a mime. I do mime. That's what I do with my body. I'm a trained mime. Um, but my agents told me I'm not allowed to do mime anymore because it does not work on the radio. So, and I'm not landing podcasts very easily. So I'm doing some relatable stand. I find relatable humour very difficult to do because of my upbringing and she was like, talk about your childhood, and I did, and she was like, not everyone grew up with a panic room, elf. So I'm gonna be, she's like, hey, just talk about your normal dating experiences. So that's what this is. It's just gonna be filth. <laughs> filth, filth, filth. And then, because originally I didn't want to do straight stand-up, I find straight stand-up quite difficult, because normally I find eye contact quite difficult. So the thing is, with doing stand-up, you've got to do a lot of eye contact, and then you do it, and then I forget to blink, and then... <laughs> And then I end up looking at you like this, and you've just discovered what your version of Pennywise is, and it's me. Okay. Very into. Okay. We... Okay. Thank you. Um. So, because uh, I originally wanted to do my new. So this is just. An... There's no narrative. It's just filth for an hour or 50 minutes, 10 minutes. You know, let's see how it goes. Um. If not, I'll bring out a mime. Uh. But I wanted. <laughs> Fill the time, um, but we're just releasing this as audio, so they'll just think the track's gone. Um, I, <laughs> but I, I originally wanted to do a stand-up show. Well, I wanted to do a show where I reenact all my favourite horses from history. <laughs> <laughs> and my agent was just like, "Just once, can you make a show that's financially viable?" 
Because I like to make shows that are really... So uh, one show I did was a one-woman production of Swan Lake in an hour in French. Um, and that it was received. And... Uh, <laughs> And I did one show where I retold the whole history of economic theories in an hour, but um, whilst hula hooping, because as a comedian, you've got to stand out. And at the end of the show, I gave birth to the earth whilst dressed as a lion. Um, yes, so you know what? Maybe my agent was right. So we're going to do some straight stand up, but I find it quite difficult to do. So uh, the because I don't really. Uh, um, so the reviews I've been told in the past, um, I've been described as the Times described me as an ordeal. Oh, oh what? Oh what? Stop it! Being described as a natural clown. Oh, so charismatic. You can't take your eyes off her. Oh. Two stars, the Independent. A lot to emotionally unpack. My favourite was an ungainly absurdist female comedian with very long arms. Because you got to know. A lot of people watch my comedy going, I'd enjoy her more if I just knew how long her arms were. So this is just it. This is an hour of filthy comedy because I've always been quite a sexual person. Um, I really like um, uh, date, like love. I think it's quite fun. Um, I love my body. Give me a cheer if you love your body. <laughs> oh, lovely, thank you. I don't really, I don't mean like I love my body. In my body's like, oh, it's the best body in the whole wide world. But every day I wake up and I look myself in the mirror and I think, oh, well done. <laughs> Good work, team. We've done it again. <laughs> Different size, different jiggly bits, lovely jubbly. <laughs> Let's go for a walk. <laughs> like I like, you know, I'm proud, I'm proud of all. This one's a B, this one's a D. <sighs> My truth. I've always called this one JK Rowling, because at the beginning, I really liked her, but now she's a bit of a hassle. <laughs> Covered in back rolls. Oh, and also I'm covered in cellulite. Mmm, I'm like a tall sex of orange. I love it. I love the fact when I lie on my side and it rains, it collects like rock pools for the animals. And I feel like Mother Nature. Feed from me, rats of London. And I'm a genitals party and rave. Um, I just have it all. It's nice. I, do you know what? I'll tell you this. Um, I know it's scripted. There is a script, but I am going to go off piste. Um, <laughs> Because I just like to share. Oh, I've got to do the microphone, sorry. Um, Thea, do I have to use the microphone? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that is the one time I will listen to a man! <laughs> so basically, I go swimming, okay? I'm a beautiful swimmer. Oh my goodness, fantastic front crawl. And I love it. And I go to this gym, and it's a really bougie, bougie gym. And this happened about three weeks ago. So I go to this gym. And you don't need to full, know the full details, but basically what happens in the changing room, I take my clothes off before I put my swimming costume on to go in the pool. That's what happens when you go swimming. Because <laughs> they get really cross if you go in like this, <laughs> with the swimming hat on. And I'm in the changing room. I've just, I'm about to go swimming, I can't remember. I was naked in front of the mirror, doing my hair. And this, and there was no one else in the changing room. And there was the most beautiful, beautiful girl in the whole white, like she was so like, Gorgeous, you know this. You know she just she had like a really healthy gut bio, and she she looked like she really knew she could really handle all her different WhatsApp groups, and she looked, you know, she looks like she would never price you out of a hen do. You know, I am so fucking fed up of being priced out of hen do's at the moment. My whole life is like this person is like, hi, I'm running the hen do. So I've looked at everyone's studio calendars. And even though everyone's based in Bristol and London and works Monday to Friday, I've decided to organise a four-day midweek trip to Bogota. <laughs> it will cost £5,000 each. I need it in cash. <laughs> anyway, so this girl came in. She was so beautiful. She was like... She was like a horse. Like if I'd act her out, black beauty. Just beautiful. <laughs> just long and elegant. She came into the room and she took off her clothes because she, I think, was going swimming too. That, or she's, a, you know, very body confident on the cross trainer. And she took her clothes off and she was just glowing. And she was so happy in herself. And I looked at her through the reflection in the mirror and I just went, oh my God, 
you're gorgeous. And I said it out loud, which you don't do. And she quite rightly froze, because she panicked, and then turned to look at me, the weird one. And I, without breaking, like, breaking sort of panic or breaking to eyesight with myself, I continued to look myself dead in the eye in the mirror and go, oh my God, you're gorgeous. Oh my God, you're gorgeous. Oh my God, you're gorgeous. Getting pinker and pinker and pinker and pinker. Looking like I'm manifesting. And she's going, and she just turned and she went, oh, you go girl. And it was really beautiful and such a lovely way for that story to end. But the reason I'm stressed about it is that I go to this gym every single day to go swimming and we've bumped into each other now multiple occasions in the changing room. In order for her not to realize what happened the first time, that means I have had to keep going, oh my God, you're gorgeous to myself in the mirror. And everyone's like, who's that fucking weird woman with her eyes closed pretending to be a horse chanting to herself in the reflection? I just thought it was quite funny. So I thought I'd share. I mean, arguably, that's the point of this whole set. Um, imagine that in mime. <laughs> so this. I, um, I, I don't really, I find beginnings of stand-up shows really difficult. Um, I've got a lot of rage in me. I think that's quite relatable, I suppose. Is it relatable? It's nodding. Great, that's exactly, that's exactly the response I want. Um, <laughs> it's very audible. Uh, <laughs> I, but I've got a huge amount of rage in me, and I think that makes me quite intimidating and quite uh, 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 frightening to a lot of people. I think I'm friendly, but I, to a lot of people, they get very scared. Um, <laughs> And I did this stand, I didn't realize how angry I was. I did this stand up gig um, pre COVID, and it was in Brighton. And it was at The Comedian. It was an all female comedy gig. And because we've got those now, it wasn't a charity event. And, um, <laughs> and it was wonderful. And it, the green room was lovely. No one had started taking cocaine yet at that point. It was just like a really, everyone had eaten dinner. It was a really lovely, healthy space. <laughs> we're all chatting. Everyone had a really healthy attitude to alcohol. And we're all in the green room having a lovely conversation. And then the organizer ran in and was like, I'm so sorry, but there is a stag do in the audience. And I don't know. I couldn't get them out. I didn't have a cup big enough and I couldn't find any paper. I couldn't remove them. There's no window. So I'm really sorry. They're on the front row. I don't know what to do. And everyone's panicked because stag do's are notoriously the worst audiences to have at a comedy gig, okay? And we were thinking, fuck, this is going to be terrible. And I thought, you know what? When I first started doing comedy, you know, it was so hard to have a bill with just one female comic on it. And the fact we've got an all-female comedy bill now, and there's a stag do in the audience. They've looked at this lineup, they've seen that comedy lineup, and they've gone, yep, yeah, we want to go to a comedy night. We want to ruin that one. <laughs> I was like, wow, that means we've moved so far forward <laughs> in perceptions of women in comedy. I was like, that's beautiful. That's really, wow, fantastic. And I thought, great, if they want to come and they want to heckle, that is absolutely fine, because we'll defeat them, because we are professional comedians. <laughs> Welcome. And then I found out that they were there because they'd not been allowed into a strip club. <laughs> so they'd done that typical thing of going, right, we've got to go somewhere where the women are on a podium slightly higher than us. Otherwise, Gavin's going to have a terrible time and he's not going to want to marry Sandra. What are we going to do? And so they come to this comedy gig and they're all there in the front row, very traditional stag do, you know, all different shapes of dim sum and, you know, like, all different shades of beige, all dressed up like different Mario characters, you know, they're all like, look, 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 Gavin is gay, I actually love Gavin, family guy references. And they're all there. And then the first act came on the stage and they're like, right, okay, she's doing really interesting, innovative, absurdist comedy, which I've never heard before, but I cannot see her bosoms. Somebody throw ice cubes at her. 
And then the second act came on. They're like, right, OK, she's doing political satire, undergutting our current political regime. But I cannot see her clitoris wherever I think that may be. And <laughs> quickly throw some crisps at her. And then I came on and they got incredibly confused. They're like, what is it? Is it a ruler? Is it a daddy long legs that's had a bad day? I don't, where is it from? Does it know what voice it wants to have? Is it one of those things that has hot air blowing through it at the petrol station? What is it? I don't understand her very nuanced impression of an MRI machine. Quickly. Uh, heck of her. And I thought, you know what? Fuck off. I've got on a bus to get here and I'm being paid in exposure. <laughs> so I did a deep breath and I just turned to the lead one, the one that most recently had gout, and just put my foot on his shoulder and I went, look, it's okay to be intimidated by power. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought that would put them in their place. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> and they got very excited. Like, oh, she's quite sexy, actually. <laughs> Quickly, see what else she could do. See what other <laughs> mechanical implements she could do an impression of. Washing machine, actually very good. Oh, and they, <laughs> so they're heckling, heckling, and I was so annoyed. So I turned around and did a power pose because I watched a TED talk. And, <laughs> took a deep, and also, you can, you can use this at home. Took a deep breath and just went, Why don't you stick your hand up my asshole and wank off my shit, little boy? <laughs> and they all started crying. And I came. <laughs> And I got told again that I was a bit intense. And I'll tell you another story, because I thought I managed that perfectly. But afterwards, all the other acts were like, oh, you're quite scary. But the washing machine impression, perfect. <laughs> but I did another gig. Don't worry, I'm not just going to be listing on my comedy gigs. Not one of those nice guys. <laughs> but I, um, I, went, I was off to a gig, and it doesn't really matter. It was on the way to a gig. But I was walking across a road, um, because the gig lived on the other side. <laughs> The gig lived on the other side of the road. I just, it's really important you know the geography. And, and I was listening to my audio book, uh, Dune, uh, by Frank Herbert, quite complex. And I, and I was really concentrating. And I was in my dirty little denims with my cellulite light out, living my best life, um, feeling really confident. And this man was in his car on the road. So well done, correct place to be. Um, clearly wasn't doing that well, didn't have a ceiling on the car. And he... <laughs> And he saw me in his dirty, in my dirty little denims, and he leaned out and he went, "Bitch, get your cunt out, please." <laughs> Which I would argue is the most shocking part of that sentence. It's like I objectify women, but I've got minis. <laughs> and I was like, I paused my audio. I went, "Excuse me." And he was like, "Bitch, get out, you cunt." Please? I was like, this guy's done this before. And I was like, well, he's been so polite. And I liked to change. Boop, 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 boop. So I just walked in front of the road. Boop, 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 boop. Stood in front of his car. Boop, 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 boop. Rolled down my pants. Boop, 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 boop. Rolled down my knickers. Boop, 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 boop. Pulled down my tampon. Boop, 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 boop. And threw it into his car. And he... And he looked very frightened. He's like, what is this magical crayon? And he started crying, and then I came. Uh, what's that? A callback? Uh, my ex over lockdown said he didn't want to have sex with me because he found me too frightening. Uh, we weren't exes at the time, but we were really working towards it. And we, I mean, Alex, he was like, I don't, I don't want to have sex with you. I find you too scary. Put the hammer down, and I was like, just thumb it in. I will do the work. <laughs> be there on this Zoom meeting and I'd just be dragging myself along the carpet like a dog with worms going, fertilise me! Fertilise me! Fertilise me! My vibrator looked like it'd been through the dishwasher. <laughs> Do 
<laughs> I've always been quite that. Re is that relatable? <laughs> I think you'd like me more if I was Sea Biscuit. <laughs> but do you remember this? Because I, I was thinking about this. I've always, I, I am sexual. And it's really lovely being thirty. Like I'm thirty-one, and I, I, when I say I love my body, I love every year I get older. I think it's genuinely amazing. I think it's like really cool, and I, I really, I, and I feel so at ease. And I also love the fact that I'm now too old for a lot of dads in their 40s for their second marriage. I love that. And I'm now too old for a lot of my male friends in their 30s who are like, you know what? I've just met this really mature, really mature 22-year-old. She's, so, and I'm like, is she mature? She's so mature. And I'm like, do you know who's also mature? Yeah. Someone your own fucking age. Well, I love that, but I was finding this because I, I was, I, you know what was uh, funny? I, well, I think this, there was a man on the train who looked at me and he kept on saying, I was like, excuse me, is everything all right? And he went, I just wanted to say that you were going to make a beautiful 65 year old. <laughs> I was like, I love how he's objectifying the future version. <laughs> The only time I'm, I don't mind. But do you remember this? Um, I think this was relatable, but this did not work on Radio 4. Do you remember when you started this, when you realised how nice it felt to rub yourself on things? <laughs> oh, come on, don't leave me now! <laughs> not when I'm doing some physical theatre! <laughs> But do you remember this? Like, so for, so for girls when you're little, it was rubbing yourself on like the end of things and you're like, and everyone would be like, what's that? What are you doing? You're like, oh, this feels really nice. What's that? You've got some sweets in a minute. Um, and for boys, it was going over bridges. Do you know all I... I'm being... Yeah, he knows. <laughs> but I, I remember, so when I was little, I used to live with my nanny and granddad squeak, okay? And you don't really need to know much against, about them, except they were really into amphetamines and they had a gun. But they were great, <laughs> great grandparents, okay? My nan doesn't like me talking about amphetamines, so I'll change it, so they just had coke. And we, I used to live with them, and they would, every night, they would watch Silent Witness with Helen Mirren. And I thought she was just so good at her job. <laughs> And they would watch it every day. And I would lean against the sofa and I'd go, oh, I like Helen Mirren. She's very, very good. She solved that crime very quickly. I've, ma oh, I've made myself very happy. And my nanny and granddad tweet, we go, what are you doing, Emily Malimily? And I'd go, I'm making myself happy. And they'd go, oh, well, you may continue. And so every night I used to make myself happy on the sofa. The problem was they also had a VHS tape of Silent Witness, so I'd watch it repeatedly. And I would just be on that sofa day and night to the point that I started to erode the material. And Nanny Squeak didn't want to upset me, so she was like, look, can you at least go on to the other side just to balance it off? And I was like, no, Nanny, I like this side. And then she put plastic sheeting over it to make sure it didn't erode, but actually that really made it nicer. So I was really like, oh, it gets some very liquid, have a party. And so I was really sliding off it. And so because it was just becoming a bit too much, my nanny and Granda Squeak used to have a, I've lost some of you, I didn't have a you all from the beginning. <laughs> Uh, bowl. They used to have a bowl of fruit. Did you or anyone in your families have like a bowl of fake fruit? Some people nodding, some people going, no, we had real fruit. <laughs> they used to have a bowl of like wooden fruit, glass fruit, plastic fruit. And my nanny Squeak, she went to this and she got out the pear. And she went, Emily, Emily, this is your magic pear. So when you want to make yourself happy, Rather than using the sofa, <laughs> after you've done your cumon, you can come to me and you can have the magic pair. And I was like, that sounds like a fantastic agreement. <laughs> Shake hands, <laughs> lovely. And so every time I was doing work, I finished reading my Goosebumps book, I was like, Nanny Squeak, may I have my happy pair, please? <laughs> and she'd be like, have you tidied your room? And I'd go, yes. And she goes, well, let me go and get it. And she'd get it. My reading level sort, okay? <laughs> and I think that is such a healthy attitude to childhood masturbation. I think that's a really beautiful thing. And it's so nice because it's the one thing she left me in the will. Um, <laughs> like it's just genuinely beautiful. I love it. I just think it's beautiful. But I, I didn't realise that that's uh, such an odd thing because I, I also didn't realise watching Helen Mirren 
I was uh, that that I might like girls. Like I just thought sh I just thought I loved efficient women, and that is absolutely <laughs> true. And anyone who works in science immediately, vroom, like just do you know what people talk about bisexuality? Quick, I don't know. I just if you like reading books, you like submarines, and you're interested in horses, you pretty much got a shoe in. You know what I mean? I'm very I'm very open minded. I'm like, are oh, you kind? Can you hold my hand crossing the road? Absolutely, have a nosh. <laughs> we will edit that, okay? <laughs> Saying that I'm looking, I haven't done any of the script yet. <laughs> Got to keep to the script, there isn't one. <laughs> well, I didn't realise I might be, uh, I might be bisexual or gay, or I didn't know what the term was. And when I was about ten, I got sent to a boarding school. How to alienate an audience in one sentence? I hear you cry. <laughs> It was after a very difficult experience where I'd been trapped in a panic room during my summer holidays. And I went to this boarding school and, uh, and I, before anyone makes any judgments, it was genuinely the most diverse and dynamic group of oligarchs children in one space. <laughs> And I was in this dormitory, about 12 of us, and it was all girls. And to be at a boarding school, to be gay, to like girls was probably the absolute, the worst, worst thing you could be. That and bad at lacrosse, but absolutely the worst thing, <laughs> worst thing was to, was to be a lesbian. And there was this girl at my school, and her name was Bertie Ahern. And she was honestly the most beautiful girl in the world. She was so kind, and she was just like, she had like swishy, swishy blonde hair. You know that you all have that girl from school you remember who was just perfect at everything. She was like, <laughs> Hi, I'm on the hockey team. I'm on the lacrosse team. I run Latin society. I'm not afraid to admit that I work hard. I'm Bertie Ahern. <laughs> hey, stop that, Amber. Bullying is wrong. <laughs> I'm Bertie Ahern. <laughs> Quickly, there's a building on fire. It's a guinea pig rescue. We must go. I'm Bertie Ahern. <laughs> I was in love. And we were in the school production of Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. <laughs> and I begged, I begged to be in it. Just so I could watch it. And she would, every day she'd go, those Canaan days we used to know. Where have they gone? Where did they go? And I would weep. I would weep. And Miss Miller would have to take me to the side and give me a banana to calm down. Because they thought it was due to my blood sugar. I was just so moved. And then Miss Miller told me, wow, she's going to lose it because she's a smoker. And I weeped. And I sent so many letters to her saying, you must stop smoking. And I did drawings and diagrams of what her lungs would look like, which is not a way you get a person to walk to you. I was in love with her. Anyway, I was in my dormitory one night and all the other girls, and there were 12 of us, all different parts of the world, all spoke different first languages, which genuinely made Eurovision a big deal. <laughs> and the girls came into the room and stood around and they went, eel, 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 which stands for Emily and Lions or English as an additional language. Eel, 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 do you like girls? Do you like girls? Do you like, do you like girls? Do you like girls? Do you like that? Oh, lashes. Do you like girls? Do you like girls? Do you like tattoos? All the things she said, all the things she said, running through your hand, running through your hand, running through your hand. Do you really resonate with the gossip standing in the way of control? Do you like girls? Do you, do you like girls? Do you love Willow from Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Do you love girls? Do you? Do you want to rub your knees against another girl? And I was like, wow, what a wonderful, supportive space. Uh, I absolutely feel so comfortable to talk about my truth. And I said, well, actually, I, um, I really love Bertie Ahern. Um, I thought her speech in assembly about um, the classical civilization was really beautiful. And I never knew so much about Athens. And um, I, think, I think I might be in love with her, actually. And they went, Ugh! she's a gay! We hate them and she can't play lacrosse! Quickly, whistle! Woohoo! Because that's how you call nuns. And suddenly all these nuns appeared. <laughs> Twelve nuns, a disciple of nuns, all around there looking at me. And they were like, she's a gay! And they're like, burn her! And genuinely, because um, they moved me into the sick room 
for a week because they deemed me a health and safety risk to the other girls and the girls didn't feel safe in my company. So I got moved to it. I didn't mind it because it reminded me of a panic room. And so I was like, mm, it's fine with me. <laughs> I got my book on submarines. And I was in this room and eventually I had to apologise and say, I wasn't actually in love with Bertie Hearn. I just thought she had really nice eyelashes and she just worked incredibly hard and she was proof of what you could do with your GCSEs. <laughs> and... And I was eventually moved back into the dormitory. And, uh, and it was really stressful because she never spoke to me again. Um, and I always found it really... Oh, I'll turn that the other way. Um, I got that trap there. But it was weird because even now, like, I'm a 31-year-old woman and I'm very confident and I feel very... Like, I, I think I'm quite a nice person. I find it... I've never been able to be in a relationship with a woman. And I think it's because subconsciously in my head, I find it really hard to chat women up because I always think in my head, I'm a threat or I'm not... You know, I'm I'm dangerous, and it's it's hard because I try and chat up women. And I'm really really bad at it. Like I'm awful. Like no offense. Like chatting up men. Oh my god, so easy. It's so easy. Sleeping with a man in London is easier than getting an Uber. Okay. <laughs> It takes you longer than six minutes. I'm like, fuck this shit. Is there anyone called John in the house? <laughs> Boom. Easy, easy peasy. But trying to like chatting up boys, it's just like, hi, vroom, done. Hi, I don't have any opinions. Vroom, hi, I love your feedback on my stand up comedy set. Vroom, hi, do you want to walk around a graveyard with me? Vroom. <laughs> You've died. <laughs> Do you need water? You're right. You're okay. <laughs> yeah. No. No offence. It'd be a nightmare if you died just for editing. <laughs> Don't be selfish. The only time that I end up getting chatted up or chatting to girls tends to actually be after a comedy gig, right? So I will tend to do a comedy gig and most people watch and they're like, okay, she seems relatively stable. <laughs> it's evident the phylloxetine has ki kicked in. <laughs> do you know what I mean? She, she seems fairly, you know, literate. <laughs> she evidently knows a lot about horses. Yeah, why not? And I'll finish the set and then this girl will tend to approach me after a set. Hi. My name's Topaz. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I loved your set. Yeah, I know a lot of the audience didn't, but I thought it was... <laughs> I thought the MRI machine was great. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm 32. I'm a PhD uh, student in archaeology. Isn't it interesting how <laughs> sometimes the thesis tells you more about the researcher than the research itself? <laughs> oh, what's this? Oh, it's just a Jack Carrack quote on my arm. And that's my dog, Gatsby. <laughs> I love succulents. <laughs> I was wondering, I don't know how you feel, but maybe you could come back to mine and play Warhammer. What? I'm so multifaceted. <laughs> I've got a vinyl player. We can just dance to some LPs. Have you heard of Bob Dylan? <laughs> We have some turmeric tea and maybe I can read you some poetry by Mary Oliver. <laughs> How does that sound? <sighs> and I'm like, that sounds very nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite up for that. Yeah, so sure, I can paint some. Have you got Warhammer 40,000? Uh, some Tyranids, some Space Hawks? I'll do that, yeah. Fine. She was great. Let me just go and get my boyfriend, Bill. And then Bill appears. <laughs> I'm 59! I'm wearing a fedora! What's this, my friend? A ukulele? Do you like the Beatles? Oh, it's a latex jacket. Oh, is this a coke nail? <laughs> I love tantric yoga. I'm a feminist. Don't mind 
me. I'll just sit in the corner like the Skeksis from the Dark Crystal with my sad, lonesome thumb. Is that relatable? <laughs> that is so annoying. I'll tell you this. Uh, this is one thing that is true. Like, uh, this is where we get a bit more serious. <sighs> Please stop asking me to join your threesomes. I do not want to come at your threesomes. I've had more threesomes in my life than I have successfully cooked pasta. <laughs> and I have never been able to cook pasta because I am too busy having threesomes. And it is a lot easier to tell if a man is al dente. A lot more enjoyable throwing them against a wall. Not the right person you invite to a threesome. I like naps. I've got OCD. I'll spend the whole time trying to rearrange where everyone's genitals are. <laughs> I'll finish on this story. I write for, and you probably, you probably know this. <sighs> uh, it's probably the reason you came to the show. But I write for Guinea Pig Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll do signatures at the end. Uh, so I write for Guinea Pig Magazine. I used to be the celebrity writer. And then too many people wrote in saying they don't know who I am. And, and so, so now I just write. Uh, uh, so give me a if any of you have got guinea pigs. Oh, who's got a pit bull? I spotted that. If you don't know what a guinea pig is, sock-sized Ewok inefficient duster. Um, <laughs> I love them. Oh, and uh, about a year ago, I was, I had four guinea pigs. They've all passed away due to old age, just so you know. But at the time, they were present and alive. And there was Ian McCulloch, Clara Cupcakes, Pazuzu, and Badger. And there were the four of them, <laughs> lovely little guinea pigs, adopt, don't shop. And they were in my house, and I needed to get a new guinea pig hutch. So I went on Gumtree, which is the start of every beautiful story. <laughs> And I searched for a guinea pig hutch, and I found this one sold by this guy. And he was, seemed really nice, and in the background of the picture, there were loads of books, so many books. Chatting away about the guinea pigs, guinea pig hutch, and he said, oh, um, I'm also a book collector. And I said, oh, wow, what type of books? He went, oh, rare ones. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Great info. And I was like, oh, what time? And he went, oh, well, I've actually got a first edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> if there was a chair, I'd be sliding off it. What? <laughs> first edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula? And he went, yes, well, when you come to collect the hutch, maybe you could come and uh, take a look. And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> He's like, why have you got a microphone? <laughs> I'm pro. So... Being a grown-up woman of 31, I, of course, went to this man's house and did not tell anyone where I was going. So I went to this man's house up in North London, in Angel, actually. Uh, the front door opened, so he hadn't lied. He did live in a house. Uh, the door opened. <laughs> I can't do doors. And, uh, and he was just standing there, a wonderful man in his cape, and he looked at me. And he went, Wow, you're tall. <laughs> You're almost as tall as my ex-wife. She's not dead. <laughs> Come this way. <laughs> Went into this house and it was like, I felt like Belle from Beauty and the Beast. There were books everywhere. No guinea pigs, but books everywhere. And I thought, clearly not a very good guinea pig owner. That's why he's getting rid of the catch. And he was turning to me, he was like, so have you always been six foot? And I was like, yeah, I was all the other heights first, but I, like, I really <laughs> picked, on, picked on this one. And he's like, are you, are you six foot horizontal and, and vertical? And I was like, yes, unless, <laughs> unless the magic trick goes wrong. Yeah, very pretty much. And he's like, do, do you like parties? <laughs> I was like, I've been known to dabble. 
and then stuff. Oh, that reminds me, I've got a joke that ruined my mum's book club. Do not let me forget to tell you. <laughs> It was apparently ruined our interpretation of orange is not the only fruit. <laughs> well, apparently I spread the gay agenda too much. <laughs> so somebody remind me. Um, he's like, so do you go to parties? I was like, yeah, you know, I go to my mum's book club occasionally. He went, well, uh, me and my ex-wife before she died, before she moved away. Um, <laughs> We used to go to a lot of parties. I was like, are you all right? He went, yeah, no, I just like to move around the space. <laughs> He's like, and I'm going to a party this Friday and I, uh, I've got two tickets and I thought maybe you'd like to come to the sex party. It's in Camden. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's really lovely. Thank you. And he went, there's an aerial artist. <laughs> <laughs> And he went, she's paid. And I was like, well, that's good. You're supporting the arts. <laughs> I see. But there's a face painter. <laughs> oh, really? She's doing it for a ticket. Okay, that's lovely. And there's a free buffet. Ah, I will come. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the agreement was I turn up at his, um, he'd cook us dinner, we'd have a bottle of wine. And then we get us, he'd get us an Addison Lee. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. To the sex party. <laughs> no pressure. And then he'd book me one home afterwards. So I was like, perfect. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So when I turn up at his house, we go downstairs to his kitchen. He's opened up a beautiful bottle of Sancerre. And he's cooked us dinner. He's cooked us <laughs> two Jacket potatoes. <laughs> Each. <laughs> no filling. <laughs> what level of cardiovascular exercise is needed at this sex party? <laughs> that you need the carbohydrate of two jacket potatoes. I'm about to put latex on. I'm gonna look like a snake that's deep-throated an ostrich's egg. So I eat these two depressing jacket potatoes and I go upstairs to put his dead wife's latex on. He told me that she'd been six foot. She wasn't even six foot standing on a ladder. I was spelling the letter W with my labia. Walking like John Wayne after he's been ruthlessly pegged. <laughs> Had to be Vaselined into the Addison Lee. <laughs> and we get to Underworld, which you've ever been there. It's like a venereal disease, but tiled. <laughs> you get judged on your outfit as you go in. Might have just been easier turning up in gaffer tape. And sex parties are very, if you've not been to one recently, they're very different to the sex parties of the past where it was just conservative party members. Now they're very <laughs> wonderful spaces. The door opens and they're like, hello, my name is Unicorn. They then come into their sex party. This is this room where we all masturbate to Lizzo. Come into this room where we peg and play Warhammer. Here's a room where white men apologize for who they are, but they like it. It's their kink. Everybody, and when you're tired, we have got some Biscuits, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And it's just wonderful. And you'll be at the sex party and someone will be like, hi, um, you're so beautiful. Uh, would you like to absolutely get railed by me and my friend? And you're like, actually, I'm fine. No worries, have a fantastic night. You look incredible. It's just <laughs> amazing. It's so good and I'm like, I'm having the time of my life. And it was animal themed. So people really loved me talking about horses. And so I was walking around. Now every sex party, if you've not been to one, um, there is a room in all sex parties where it's dedicated to people who used to be sailors or did D of E and didn't get to utilize any of the skills. And it's strictly there just for them to show all the knots they've learned. And so you go into this room, they're like, I can do a clove hitch, I can do a sheep's hitch. This hitch is really useful for tying up a canoe, but also your wife in a loving and supportive manner. And you watch them do all these beautiful knots and everyone's like, well done, and then they come. <laughs> Wonderful, and I'm in this room and there is this girl having the absolute best time being absolutely like, poor, like, 
pumped away by a man face painted as a zebra and a giraffe, okay? And she is occasionally taking and eating a massive sandwich from the buffet, putting it down and replacing it with a dick. And that's self-care. And she should go into politics because that's someone I'd vote for because she knows what joy is. And so she's having the best time of her life. I'm walking around looking at all the knots going, yeah, no way, you did cow's week, fantastic. And turn away. And this woman appears, swishy, swishy hair, the type of woman that only walks backwards. <laughs> and she was like, <laughs> that wasn't her face. She was wearing like a mask. <laughs> and then she got weird. <laughs> Arguably, some of these jokes, I said them to my dad, and my dad was like, please don't tell some of these jokes on stage, otherwise people will think you're weird. And I was like, dad, everybody already does think I'm weird. Because when I was little, kids used to throw rocks at me because they thought I was weird, but the joke's on them because I collected rocks. And <laughs> she took the mask off and she turned to me, she went, excuse me, you're new here. Are you Elf Lions? And I was like, <laughs> Um, yes, I am. And she went, do you write for guinea pig magazine? <laughs> I was like, yes, I do. She went, me and my husband, boop, boop. And this man dressed as a dog appeared. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> in a bowl with his name on. She was pouring champagne into it. Again, brilliant relationship there. And like, me and my husband, we rescue guinea pigs. Show her the pictures. And he removed his phone and was showing me all these pictures of guinea pigs that they rescued. Oh, we named them after our favourite uh, economists. So this is Milton Freeman. This is John Maynard Keynes. And so we're looking at these. And as we're talking about the guinea pigs, this woman here getting railed, just so... Sorry. Excuse me. I don't mean to interrupt. But did you mention guinea pigs? When I was a child, I saved lots of guinea pigs from a burning building. I'm Bertie Ahern. <laughs> And there, there we go. And there, I found my people. Um, that's um, that's basically that's basically the show. There's no. There used to be a sad. We'll cut this bit. But there was used to be a sad bit in it. But I got rid of it because I was like, I did enjoy. It. Pardon? Yeah. Oh, oh, thanks, babe. Um, I'll come to it in a minute. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, oh, what a nice crowd. <laughs> Uh, so it was really joyful to do that. And we'll, we'll, do you know what? I'm going to edit it as well. I've got this idea. So once you send me the footage, I was thinking I could cut, you know, Pazuzu from The Exorcist during the show. I could cut glimpses of it. So when people are watching it on YouTube, they'll be like, what the fuck's going on? Do you know what I mean? I'm just like, you know, I, I like, I'm like, how can I make my career progression even harder? <laughs> but I'll tell you this story. So this is the, this is a joke that said my, my mum uh, said ruined book club. Um, which I helped set up with her, actually, but it's a good book club. Um, well, uh, they didn't read my book on vampires. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, kind of lingus. <laughs> I, what, a, what a lovely day. <laughs> nibble, nibble. <laughs> now, if there are any femmes in the room and you are dating a male uh, masculine person who does not want to go down on you, who's like, uh, no, thank you. Uh, I can't work it out. What are all the little bits? It's like a file of facts. I can't work it out. It's an origami looking sashimi feeling love dungeon. I can't work it out. There's too many layers. So get lost in it. I don't want to go down there. <laughs> Kill him. He doesn't deserve you. But if also you're on your period ever, and because normally on your period, sometimes you're like, oh, yes, please. You're like, whoa. We all fucking know, but, we're like, but it's like, it's so good, isn't it? You're like, yes, you're like a sexy The Shining lift doors. And you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love my crowd. Uh, and sometimes you're on your period and you're like, oh, and you're like, oh, I want to do so. Maybe you could go there. And they're like, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, uh, I'm going to be sick. That's disgusting. Burn the witch. Burn the witch. I don't want to go down there, but please look at my sad little dead rabbit hanging out of a dog's mouth. Look at that. Oh, I've boiled it. Oh, 
Oh, stick that in there. Oh, it's got, I've done hockey. Look at him. Oh, if they're like, oh, I don't want to go down then. You, you, you call me and I will kill them. Because the thing is, being a lesbian and vegan, I don't have a choice. It's the only way I can get iron. Um, some people, I split the room. <laughs> some people are like, oh, I really like the joke. And some people are like, why is she saying that? Doesn't she want us to find her attractive? <laughs> um, you've been really delicious and delightful. And thank you for coming to the show at half fucking six on a Tuesday, which is normally the day when you get all the emails because people are like, we're going to be nice and avoid them on the Monday. And then Tuesday's like, boom, 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 boom. So thank you. Um, if you enjoyed the show, please... I mean, I'm not going to do it again, actually. But, I mean, just tweet it and say that you enjoyed it. Um, or follow me on Instagram. And, actually, if you... I'm doing my horror show, Raven. And it's... A, oh, thank you. Uh, at Leicester Square Theatre on the 16th of June. It's a 90-minute horror extravaganza with lots of mime. And I love it. And, it would be, and that's the last time I'll be doing it. So, please come and see that. And then, also, if you want to see the pegging play, it's called The Misandrist. And it's on at the Arcola and it opens on the 10th of May. And it's a two-hour play with just me and one other man. And it's like one other, it's one, another man and, and this. And uh, so please come along to that. But also just have a lovely life and see comedy. And yeah, just be happy. <laughs> Bye, guys. Woo!